Welcome to the New Hampshire Secrets, Legends, and Lore podcast, where twice a month we explore the world of New Hampshire that lies outside of the hard news. I'm your host, Wayne King, and I invite you to join us for an adventure that will take us on a journey together to explore those things that are unlikely to make the pages of your newspaper, the waves of your radio station, or the bits and bytes of your favorite news website. Yet for many of us, these stories will reveal what makes life here in the Granite State truly worth living. Together we'll uncover some secrets, speculate on a few rumors and legends, and we'll meet the people and a critter or two, both living and long departed, who weave together the colorful tapestry of New Hampshire's past, as well as some who are helping to build our future. We'll explore places known and unknown that you will want to add to your bucket list. We'll laugh together, gasp together, and maybe even shed a tear or two. Welcome to New Hampshire Secrets, Legends, and Lore. Today we're going to explore the birth of a new breed of dog and a great adventure to the farthest reaches of the planet. All beginning right here in the Granite State. The relationship between humans and dogs likely goes back to a time before we could even communicate with one another. It is without doubt the stuff of legend and lore. New Hampshire can claim a special part in that long trail of legend and lore because of one very special dog and the man who loved, raised, and trained him and turned his remarkable traits into a unique breed of working dog. Walt Disney himself could not have created a more powerful story of love between a man and a dog and the achievements spawned by that affection. Arthur Treadwell Walden was born on May 10th, 1871. If you hadn't figured it out, he is the human in the story. He was born in Indianapolis, Indiana, to an Episcopal minister named Reverend Treadwell Walden and his wife, Elizabeth Layton. Walden spent most of his youth in the neighboring state of Minnesota, but in 1890 his father was appointed minister of St. Paul's Cathedral in Boston, and the family moved. By now, 19 years of age, Arthur Walden found that he was not suited for city life and he moved to his father's vacation home beneath the peaks of the Sandwich Range in Tamworth, New Hampshire, and more specifically to a beautiful little unincorporated community in the northwestern corner of Tamworth known as Wana Lancet, named for the revered sachem of the Penobscot tribe. 
We'll talk about Juan Lancet in a future podcast, along with his father, the legendary Passaconaway. Arthur Walden was a restless, adventurous fellow. In March of 1896, Walden heard the call of the wild and headed to the area that would soon be known as the Alaska Territory, what we now know as the state of Alaska, only recently purchased from Russia for two cents an acre. In August of that year, gold was discovered in the neighboring Klondike region of Canada and soon Walden found himself working as a freighter, carrying supplies and mail down the Yukon River by dog sled. It was at this time that he became experienced with sled dogs that were used to pull freight over vast distances. Just as cowboys, who were often referred to as cow punchers, the use of sled dogs led to freighters being nicknamed dog punchers. Walden lived in the Klondike region for about five years before returning to New Hampshire, where in 1902 he married Catherine Sleeper, the daughter of a newspaper magnate from Boston, who also had developed an affinity for the little community of Juan Lancet. Together, the couple operated the 1,300-acre Juan Lancet Farm and Inn, first purchased by Catherine in 1890. Catherine ran the inn and Arthur Walden, inspired by his years in the Klondike, began training and breeding sled dogs at the farm. Walden wanted to create a new breed of sled dog, one with tremendous power, endurance, speed, and a friendly, gentle nature. Arthur Walden chose a descendant of Admiral Peary's lead dog Polaris as the dam that he wanted to breed. She was a Greenland Husky named Ningo and she was bred to a dog named Kim, a large Mastiff St. Bernard sire of mixed breed. Walden was convinced that a mixed breed dog would bring him the desired traits that he was looking for in a superior sled dog. On January 17, 1917, Ningo gave birth to a litter of three pups, dogs that Walden hoped would bring him that special dog. The three pups were named Ricky, Tiki, and Tavi after the mongoose in Kipling's story of the same name in his acclaimed Jungle Book. We'll have more on this later. Ricky would later be named Chinook, after a favorite Eskimo dog that Walden had worked with in the Yukon, when it became clear that this was the dog that he had sought. Chinook has been described as being smooth and tawny with a black muzzle. He towered above other dogs at the Wanalancet farm, but it was his temperament and his heart that captured the imagination of people across the world. Chinook was truly a gentle giant with the heart of a champion. He was soon to become the world's most famous dog of his time, and Walden's faithful companion and lead dog, as well as the foundation dog for the Chinook breed of dogs recognized today by the American Kennel Club. Until the time of Chinook, most dog sleds had been made up of Huskies and Malamutes. As the owner of a Husky, I can attest to the fact that they are one step away from a wolf and not exactly the kind of animal that you would want to have as a family pet in most circumstances. Now, my dog, Boof, is a very gentle and loving fellow, but let him off the leash and he's looking for the nearest small critter to kill. Chinook would begin not only a line of dogs that would bear his name, but also a trend toward the development of mixed breed lines, especially bred as sled dogs, with a gentle disposition. 
Chinook had intelligence, power, endurance, speed. All things that Walden was looking for in a sled dog. Yet it was not only his prowess before the sled that won the hearts and minds of the public. It was also a disposition that was legendary. Chinook was, without doubt, one of history's greatest lead dogs, but unlike many of the working dogs of his time, he was gentle and friendly. Chinook loved children. And the story I'll share with you toward the end of this podcast, taken from a 1928 yearbook from Camp Mowgli, School of the Open, is a testament to the fact that his disposition as well was a part of the mark that he would make on history. Together, Walden and Chinook carved their way into the history books. Walden is also credited with bringing the sport of sled dog racing to the New Hampshire area, founding the New England Sled Dog Club in 1924, which is still in existence today. Walden's teams dominated this sled racing circuit for many years. With Chinook in the lead, Walden and his dog sled team were the first to successfully ascend Mount Washington in the winter of 1926. Now legend has it that Walden was a bit of a showman when it came to his dogs. It is said that he liked to demonstrate the capabilities of Chinook and his dog teams by sending them, with Chinook in the lead, out into the field beside his home pulling a sled without a driver. Walden would put the team through their paces by simply calling out the G and haw left and right commands of a driver through a megaphone from the comfort of a rocker on his front porch. In fact, it may have been just such a demonstration that convinced Admiral Byrd to hire him for the historic 1929 expedition in the early days of 1927. This despite the fact that at 57 years old, he was older than the job description allowed. After all, Walden was 58 when the expedition took place, by far the oldest human member of the expedition, and perhaps the one member with the most difficult job carrying rations to sustain the rest of the team. When Bird offered Walden the job, he did not immediately accept. Instead, he extracted a promise from Bird that no dog would be killed on the trip in order to save on supplies, as had been the practice in earlier expeditions. Bird accepted his condition, and the two men shook hands in a deal that would make history. Bird wrote of Walden in his diary. Had it not been for the dogs, our attempts to conquer the Antarctic must have ended in failure. On January 17th, Walden's single team of 13 dogs moved 3,500 pounds of supplies from ship to base, a distance of 16 miles each trip in two journeys. Walden's team was the backbone of our transport. Seeing him rush his heavy loads along the trail, outstripping the younger men, it was difficult to believe that he was an old man. But he had the determination and strength of youth. Now, Chinook himself was no spring chicken. At almost 12 years of age, he was the equivalent of an 87-year-old human. So, to Chinook went the real honor as the eldest member of the expedition party. Again, I quote Bird. Chinook was old when brought to the Antarctic, too old for hard, continuous labor, and Walden used him as a kind of shock troop, throwing him into a team when the going turned very hard. Then the gallant heart of the old dog would rise above his years and pull with the glorious strength of a three-year-old. Walden, Chinook, and Bird, of course, were the modern-day equivalents of rock stars. 
Newspapers and radio stations the world over followed the news of their adventure. So it was with great sadness that the news spread around the world that on Chinook's 12th birthday, he wandered away and was never found. Walden was devastated. He had lost his best friend. One member of the expedition quoted Walden as saying, I wish I was half as good a man as he was a dog. Later in the podcast, you'll see why he was wrong about this. But in any case, their story would pass down through the ages. As for Chinook, his lineage, so carefully developed by Walden, carries on in the breed that now bears his name. His loss was mourned worldwide, and the New Hampshire legislature paid tribute to one of the greatest lead dogs in history by naming Route 113A from Tamworth to Wana Lancet the Chinook Trail in his memory. The breed would eventually be named the official state dog of New Hampshire. Now you may recall that the three pups born to Ningo in 1917 were named for a character in the Jungle Book by Rudyard Kipling. It's also quite possible that the sire of those pups, Kim, was taken from another story by Kipling. While there's no evidence that Walden knew Kipling personally, though Kipling was living in Vermont at the time and it is quite possible that they met, There is, however, ample evidence of a Kipling connection, and we'll explore that when we return to this podcast featuring Arthur Walden and the famed sled dog, Chinook. I hope that you're enjoying this podcast of New Hampshire Secrets, Legends, and Lore. Now, in most podcasts, this would be the moment when I would pitch you about sleeping on some kind of mattress guaranteed to give you the best sleep of your life, or a pillow that will change your life forever, or a food service that provides you with easy-to-prepare gourmet meals. Truth is, that's just not me. I want to be able to spend my time discovering, writing, and recording great stories for you to enjoy, and I can't imagine that you would want to spend five to ten minutes listening to me extol the virtues of razors delivered right to your home or new clothing fashions that you can return if they're not up to your standards or liking. So I'm taking the chance that perhaps you will decide to support this podcast for the pure joy of it. And just in case that's not enough, I'm offering to provide you with special edition shortcasts, especially made for subscribers delivering fun, brief podcasts to your inbox every other week. It may be a tip on a special swimming hole or a great place for a winter hike or a story that is just too much fun to pass up but won't fill the space for a longer podcast. You can subscribe or make a one-time donation at nhsecrets.blogspot.com where you'll also find images and additional information related to this podcast. So there you have it. In less than two minutes, we covered all the same bases that would require five to ten minutes of advertising in other similar podcasts. All the more reason for you to become a sponsor. And now let's get back to the podcast.
So was there a Kipling connection between Arthur Walden and Rudyard Kipling? The answer I found in a group of photographs that I came across while doing some scanning for Camp Mowgli on Newfound Lake. Several of the photographs featured both the boys of Camp Mowgli as well as members of the bird expedition in those photographs. And after doing some detective work, here's what I found. Now I need to explain something here before I delve into the connection between Kipling and Walden, because you're going to hear a pronunciation of the name of Kipling's famed Jungle Boy differently here than the many Hollywood versions have used. That's because Kipling himself provided both the pronunciation and the information about how to pluralize the name to Elizabeth Ford Holt, the founder of Camp Mowgli, back in 1903, when she wrote to him to ask his permission to use the characters and the storyline of the Jungle Books as the theme for her new camp. Kipling wrote back with his blessing and said that the word Mowgli was pronounced Mao as in cow and to pluralize the name as in multiple boys one would add an S but not pronounce it. Clearly no one ever explained this to the folks at Disney and so the mispronunciation carries on despite the best efforts of those who have tried to set the record straight. After the death of Elizabeth Ford Holt, the camp was taken over by her assistant, Colonel Alcott Ferrer Elwell. Elwell continued to correspond with Kipling until the author's death in 1936. And as it turns out, the connection between Kipling and Walden had one degree of separation. Colonel Alcott Ferrer Elwell. Elwell had come to be friends with Arthur Walden through Walden's work providing sled dogs to the Army's search and rescue teams during World War I. And the visit of the Mowgli boys at the invitation of Walden was aimed to make them a small part of one of the greatest adventures in recent history, the Bird Antarctic Expedition. In the summer of 1928, Colonel and Mrs. Elwell, along with Assistant Director J. Tyson Stokes, took a group of 30 boys from the camp on the shores of Newfound Lake to the Walden Farm in Wanalancet. While today this would only be about a 60-minute trip, in 1928 it was not quite so easy. Accounts of the trip suggest that the boys and staff were on the road for about three to four hours each way. The boys would get to meet the more than 100 dogs being trained for the expedition, including Chinook. The Mowgli boys would have known of Chinook in 1928 through many magazine and newspaper articles that had already made the dog and the kennels famous. During their visit, the boys were able to watch and by some accounts help with the process of rawhiding some of the 28 sleds that would be used on the expedition. They also had the opportunity to play with Chinook, who from all accounts reveled in the chance to have a little fun with the boys. The 1928 issue of the Mowgli Howl, Mowgli's annual yearbook, contains a photograph of the sleds being worked on by four members of the expedition, Walden, as well as three members of his crew, Fred Crockett, Edward Goodale, and Norman Vaughn, often referred to as the Three Musketeers. It also includes an autograph of sorts from Chinook, a copy of his paw print, especially made for the boys of Mowgli. While all of the players in this national drama have long since passed away, 
I was fortunate enough to have the opportunity to interview David Kincannon, who along with Norman Vaughn from Walden's crew, were fellow members of the prestigious Explorers Club in New York City. Coincidentally, David was also a camper at Mowgli. David Kincannon is an attorney and explorer with nearly 40 years of experience as a scuba diver and over 25 years as a trial lawyer in courtrooms around the United States. David has lost only one trial in his legal career, his first, and he didn't like it. He has not lost another trial since 1995. David has spent a lifetime in and under the water. He began diving at the age of 14 in Newfound Lake, and then in mud holes in western Pennsylvania before graduating to the ocean and becoming a New Jersey wreck diver in the late 1980s. An avid explorer, David has sailed the Beagle Channel, climbed Kilimanjaro, dived 16,000 feet deep in the Bermuda Triangle, recovered artifacts from the Titanic, and led the expedition that found and recovered the Apollo F-1 engines that launched men to the moon. He regularly advises clients on the business of exploration through his company, Explorer Consulting, LLC. David graciously agreed to this short interview, reflecting on his conversations with Norman Vaughn in the years before Vaughn's death in 2005 at the age of 100. But I'd like to, to just have you talk a little bit about um, how you got started uh, uh, as an explorer. Um, oh, <laughs> go ahead. I'm going to embarrass you. Well, <laughs> it, because I'm talking to the man who was directly responsible for everything that I did after we met when I was a small kid. Really? I, really. Honest to God. You, my mother, look, we, you're, I was a broke, I came from a broken home. I was a scholarship kid. My mother's an alcoholic. She raised us. She worked with Barry Beal and Barry, uh, I guess, took pity on us and got us into Mowgli, uh, my brother and I, as scholarship kids. And, and you, you couldn't take a, 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 you know, 11-year-old kid from the Philadelphia suburbs who had never been really even outdoors or done anything had no opportunity no op would never have had a chance to do any of the things we did at camp drop them into the woods in new hampshire with the likes of you and paul brown and jeff shaw and lee Gehring, and not have a major influence on on their lives i didn't have my older brother was one year older he was in panther i was in aquila uh he had you know limit <laughs> limited opportunities like I did. And, you know, you couldn't be around older guys like you who were a huge, huge influence on me. And it's interesting. You know, I don't show up in any of your phot photographs and you walked around with a black, you know, with a camera around your neck all the time. I'm in one shot and I'm in the background when the uh, oars being raised, Frank Barnett's raising it and Jeff Shaw's standing next to him. You can see me in the background. I was invisible as a kid. I, I just was quiet, and um, but I absorbed everything. I played the guitar because of you. I, I don't like to hike, but I like to stand on the top of mountains. I take photographs because of you. I, you know, I was underwater. I became a scuba diver because of Jeff, because he said, go set the moorings for the sailboats, and I used scuba gear for the first time. I found the mailboat in the Blue Cove, and I was captivated. It's the first shipwreck I saw underwater. It <laughs> It all goes back to 1977 to 1980 at Camp Mowgli and the influence of the younger, um, but older, men, you know, younger men, older guys. It's directly right. related to that. Huh. I'd say draw a straight line to it. And, and so 
I learned what I was capable of at camp. I wasn't allowed to, you know, not do things. I wasn't allowed to just be, you know, sit in my bunk. I had to get out there and learn what I was capable of. It was a lot more than I thought I was. And it was because of the influence of you directly. Big time job. And then Lee, you know, last year I rode my motorcycle to to Banff, and I couldn't wait to get there because Lee Gehring had given a talk about hiking from Banff to Jasper when he did a, a campfire at Mowgli. Oh. That was last year. Wow. 50, 52 years old when I did that. I'll be darned. So you just it just stayed with me my whole life. Talk a little bit about the progression of sure. going from that to uh, to all the – amazing things that you've been doing since then. So I, uh, you know, I left, I was on junior staff for a year and then because of my circumstances, I couldn't continue to go to camp and be on staff. I had to work. And I, I worked in the summers in high school. I'm the only kid in my family to ever go to college and I had to pay for it myself. So I had to earn the money in the summertime to pay for school. And I knew that when I was in high school, I just, I knew I was never going to have a car if I didn't buy it myself. I was never going to go further. And, but what I did do was I hooked up with a friend uh, named Steve Kugath, who's out here now and he runs the wilderness program for Brigham Young University. And we, we spent a month a year outdoors after Mowgli Camping and hiking, generally in Shenandoah National Park. So if I could, you know, get a car and get all the way up to New Hampshire, I would do that. And I stayed with it. Um, I had out, outdoor opportunities in college, less so. And then when I went into law school, I only went to law school because I had a finance degree and the stock market cratered and I lost all my job offers. So I decided to ride it out right out the recession of 88 to 90 in law school hated it absolutely hated it but i decided to go through and finish early and i went to africa and i studied at the university of nairobi school of law and i studied international environmental law and i worked on conservation issues in kenya and that got me back into the outdoor world in a real way but it was all the things i learned as a boy at Mowgli, what you're capable of, it's a lot more than you think. So I went outside of my comfort zone and went to Africa and studied there and worked there. And I was there for the first ivory burn. I worked on getting elephants listed on the CITES treaty. And I was just an intern. I was just a you know kid, idealistic kid. But it was as a result of the work I did in Africa that years later, not many, I was invited to join the Explorers Club in New York City. And at the time that I joined the Explorers Club, I was one of the 10 youngest members in the world. And I was also, on all because of the African work, and some, some diving, some, I stayed with diving, and I did some exploration, shipwrecks and things like that, the basic stuff. Um, and I, uh, I was one of only three lawyers. And I quickly became the general counsel. And as general counsel, I was working with Bob Ballard and Sylvia Earle and Sarah and Hillary and all of my heroes that I never thought I'd have an opportunity to meet, interacting with them on a daily basis, on a first name basis. And they were asking me to help them with projects and expeditions. And, and then, well, then pretty soon it was, would you like to go? And I started going on expeditions. I had done a climb of Kilimanjaro when I was in law school, led that. And and I I just continued with that. I just, instead of saying why, I'd say why not? Why not? Well, why not go um, to the Titanic? Why not go, you know, with Don Walsh, the pilot of the Trieste, to go on an expedition into the Bermuda Triangle and dive 16,000 feet deep? Why not? You know, it's not what lawyers normally do. It's not what my law firm wanted me to do, but it's what I wanted to do, so I stayed with it. And then um, when you're kind of in that that realm, it's a small world, and then you're operating at a high level. I met Jim Cameron. I met, started advising him. I got to get, know Buzz Aldrin. Uh, I got invited to join a very small group of 
astronauts and um, leading experts in undersea and, and uh, space exploration called the Sea Space Symposium. I was their youngest member for a decade. I took over from Kathy Sullivan, who was the first one to walk in space, and she was just recently the administrator of NOAA. And it just, this is who I circulated with. Buzz got me the opportunity to be general counsel with the XPRIZE Foundation when they did the first private space flights. And that's how I got to know Elon Musk and, and the guys from Google and ultimately Jeff Bezos. And, um, you know, I've just kept a hand in it for decades now. And I, I still don't like lawyers. I don't, I don't like necessarily being a lawyer, although I like helping people. But I really like solving problems, and I try to solve them in the realm of exploration. And, you know, people come to me all the time and say, uh, I have an idea. How can I do this? And then we oh. take it from there. That's then. That's it. That's that's the the development from say 1980 to now. So uh, can you, can you talk a little bit more about the Explorers Club itself? I don't think a lot of people know what it's about. Yes, of course. It's it's actually one year younger. The Maui. It was formed by the members of the Arctic Club and a lot of veterans of early Arctic exploration. Its members have included uh, Scott Amundsen, Peary, Shackleton, um, uh, BB Barton, Don Walsh, all of the early astronauts from Mercury, Gemini, and Apollo. It's a place, it's headquartered in New York, but it's an international organization. 3,600 members, there's probably 30 chapters around the world, but New York is the hub and they're the spokes. And it's a place where like-minded individuals can can come and nobody ever asks you, well, uh, why do you want to do that? Instead, they say, well, why not? And Charles Lindbergh, Teddy Roosevelt, um, you know, pretty much everybody who you would think of in the world of exploration for the last century is a member or has been a member because on and on. So, so as so as uh, part of both your work and your pleasure with uh, with the Explorers Club, you had the opportunity to meet uh, someone who was actually involved in the in the bird expedition. Uh, yes. I I got to know Norman Vaughn, Captain Norm, as we call him, um, at the at the very end of his life, and he had been, he had trained the dogs for the uh, the bird expedition in the 1920s, I believe. I'm trying to remember exactly when. 28. You right. It was 20. Uh, 27 was when uh, uh, Walden. Signed on with Bird, and and they trained during the year of 28, and then went up there in 29. Down, exactly. down there, I guess. <laughs> and he, he was a kick. He, I, um, it, you know, it's not uncommon. It's it is very common actually to 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 run into people like this at the Explorers Club. It, it's and it's and so I was introduced to him. He had climbed Mount Vaughan in Antarctica, and a friend of mine was the doctor on that expedition, uh, Ken Kamler, who I ultimately took with me on the Apollo engine recovery expedition. But Ken, who who was on the board, he was he had written Doctor on Everest, et cetera, et cetera. So he introduced me to Norm, and then we had him come to Philadelphia and speak. And I got to know him, and he was quite elderly at that point. He he died at the age of 100. But I think I got to know him in his late 80s, early 90s. And I would just see him, and and uh, and, and people like that, if you have an opportunity to just spend some time with them and just talk to them one-on-one, you'd take it. You'd do it. It doesn't matter what you're late for that day. You just take a few extra minutes. And so he now, was, yeah. Now, Mount Vaughn was named by Admiral Byrd for him, correct? correct. That's correct. And and when he actually climbed the mountain, he was uh, he was well into his eighties, wasn't he? He was either eighty four or eighty seven. 
Mm-hmm. He, he was, yes, the answer is yes. He was well into his 80s. And he was still spry. He still lived in Anchorage, Alaska. He still spent time with dogs. He, uh, he, my recollection is he lived off the grid, you know, in a house with wood for heat and no electricity and things. And, and, uh, but was just, um, you know, he's, I mean, just a magical guy. It's just really one of the, the few people that you meet in your life where you, he just always smiled and he was, he, uh, he, he never, he, he didn't slow down until he was well in his nineties. And even then he was, he was talking about what he wanted to do next and coming up with ideas. And as he was his daughter or his wife, it was his wife who was sold as his daughter. It could have been his daughter had said, you know, no, he's not going to do that. Just let's just let him talk. But no, 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 he's not doing that. <laughs> <laughs> and so, and at that time, did you know that there was a connection between Camp Mowgli and the Bird Expedition? No, I didn't know that until about a year ago, and I was astonished. But not astonished because you know you the more the older you get, the more you realize that the world is a very small place, and it doesn't take much to to run into people who have connections, but no, I had no idea. And I, and I was fascinated by that. Just astonished. Yeah. I knew, he, I, I knew he was yeah. from New England. But I knew he was from New England, but I didn't know. I didn't know New, Newfound Lake, New England. Right. Well, the, he was, when, when he, he apparently lived with, uh, uh Arthur Walden for, uh, about a year <clears throat> up in the Tamworth area. Um, and that was, so the, so the boys from Mowgli and, and uh, I don't imagine that any of them are still alive, but uh, the, they uh, actually report having interactions with him. It would not surprise me at all. And, and it would be, you know, just one of those things where, you know, kudos to Colonel Elwell recognizing something significant was happening nearby to take the boys over and, you know, give them that little spark of, of, of uh, you know, a feeling of kind of belonging or, or knowing, you know, it's, that's, that's how you motivate somebody. That's how sure. you motivate a young person. And I, you, he told wonderful stories. I, I remember this, I have to say, tell this because it's priceless. He told a story about how they were down there for four months and they, they only had one pair of underwear, long johns. And so they wore them for a month. And then at the, at the beginning of the second month, they turned them inside out and continued to wear them for the next month. <laughs> and then at the beginning of the third month, they switched with the next guy who was the closest to them in size. And then they wore his underwear. And <laughs> at, the beginning of the, at the beginning of the fourth month, they turned that inside out. So by the end of the time they were there, they had had two pairs of underwear worn every single day for four months, never washed, and 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 dirty on both sides. <laughs> and it just, I just, I just, I'll never forget that as long as I live. I laughed and laughed, and uh, you know, oh, you do that, what you have to do. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's a stitch. And the other thing is, he said they didn't look forward to the day when they they exchanged underwear because they'd have to be naked momentarily. They didn't want to take it off. I hate to say I I never met him and never interacted with him with him when there wasn't a crowd around. And then like we talked about at the beginning of the conversation, where you know you're in, um, you you've got people want to talk to you. People you've got to talk to them. You've got things, and so I would take moments with him, steal time with him. And obviously, listen to him when he would speak to a group. But I didn't have the one-on-one time that I would have liked, and that I now, as especially I was a younger member of the club at the time. At now, I take that time with people. I, you know, like Buzz Aldrin, I've known for years, and I, if, if I have one-on-one time with Buzz, I take it. That doesn't matter. I just whatever he wants to say, he can say. I'll just listen. And it's so special. So um, no, unfortunately, I, I looking back on it, I wish I could have just 
you know, stolen some more moments. If it was a car ride or an elevator ride or, a, you know, waiting to go on stage type thing, I would have done it in an instant. And my thanks to Dave Kincannon, who spoke to us from his home in Sun Valley, Idaho, about his recollections both as a boy at Camp Mowgli and his explorations as one of the foremost explorers in the country now, and the opportunity he had to meet Norman Vaughn, who was a member of the Bird Expedition and part of Arthur Walden's team of sled dog trainers and drivers. Oh, and by the way, do you remember when a devastated Arthur Walden lamented that he wished he was half as good a man as Chinook was a dog? He may have been wrong about that. On March 26, 1947, the farmhouse in which Arthur Walden and his wife Catherine were living in Wallancet caught fire. Walden rescued his wife from the burning building, but was overcome by smoke, sacrificing his own life to save that of his other great love. <laughs> 